start. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you everyone for joining us today for the Department of Fish and Wildlife Service-Based Budgeting External Advisory Committee meeting. My name is James Robbins and I'm the Deputy Director of Administration for the department. Before we start, oh, sorry, turn on my camera here. Before we start uh, the meeting, we wanted to provide a brief overview of the meeting format and virtual meeting environment. All attendees will enter the meeting muted at any time during the meeting. If you would like to ask a question or make a comment, please raise your hand and wait for the moderator to recognize you. If you are attending through the Zoom app or the Zoom website, you will receive a message or a cue requesting you unmute yourself once the moderator has recognized you. To unmute yourself, select the microphone icon with a line through it. Once unmuted, the line will disappear and you will be free to speak. Attendees who have called via a landline or a cell phone and are not participating using the Zoom app or website will need to press star nine to raise their hand and once called on, star six to unmute themselves. Attendees are also encouraged to use the Q&A text option through the Zoom app and, web and website. Attendees will need to enter their name and organization if they represent, if, if they are representing an organization for the record. All comments and questions submitted will be visible to the panelists. Time will be limited, so we encourage all attendees to please keep their questions and comments concise to ensure sufficient time for everyone to ask questions or comment. Depending upon the number of individuals wishing to make comment, the Q&A moderator may establish specific time limits on comments. If you have a question or a comment regarding a specific presentation item, please raise your hand during the discussion of the item. If you have a general question or comment related to service-based budgeting, please raise your hand to be recognized during the public comment period at the end of the presentation. Please feel free to type questions related to these instructions in the Q&A field, and we will respond as they are received. We would now like to move on to the, first, uh, to the first item or to the agenda, and I'd like to introduce Chuck Bonham, the Director of the Department of Fish and Wildlife for the welcome introductions and opening remarks. Chuck? Hey, thanks, James. Let me just make sure tests can <clears throat> department staff hear me on the participant side. Yes. Yes. Great. Hey, I don't, I'm just looking at the attendees and the level of experience and the many people who've dialed in is quite high. Most of you have been on this journey with us somehow. I wouldn't say the journey dates to the beginning of time, but it feels like it's getting kind of close to that. A few of you that I see in the attendees, myself included, were actually appointed by um, resources agency back under Secretary Laird. And as y'all know, that began kind of a, a vision process for the department and the commission. And fast forward to last week, we completed a most recent milestone in the several processes we've conducted when we submitted our final service-based budget report to the legislature. As most of you know, next week we have an assembly subcommittee hearing uh, for our budget for this year. So this journey has involved hundreds of staff at the department. It has most recently had us uh, employ Deloitte as an outside expert consultant to help us navigate the last couple of years. We've looked at nearly 3000 tasks the department does. We've reorganized the way we describe ourselves into core, core program areas. We have a data set underneath our feet now with you that I think is the most transparent, the biggest, most robust data set around what we do at the department. We've been very open about the findings in the report. Uh, spoiler alert, not surprisingly, at the end of the day, the bottom line upfront conclusion is the department's assignments and mandates far exceed its capacity and its funding ability. So what you're gonna do today is turn it back to Nathan Vogley in a minute. And Nathan's gonna give you kind of one of our last external advisory committee reports about the process and note that the process doesn't end today. You've heard us say before, every year we'll be refreshing the data around the current service level 
and every five years we'll be refreshing the data and the numbers around the mission level of service. We think that this effort puts the department in an incredible place. We've institutionalized service-based budget reporting with a, a permanent full-time staff to manage the data. Uh, it's been at times tedious, but looking backwards, the, the work product I think is pretty remarkable. And of course that leaves ahead of us, what do we do about it? But with that kind of wind up, let me thank everybody that's joined us. I can actually see everybody's names. So I hope all of you are doing really well and you and your families are as healthy and safe as they can be in the pandemic. So Nathan, let me send it back to you. And then when we get to the end with q and I'll be glad to take uh, questions and try to help uh, answer them when we get to that portion of the agenda. Thanks, Nathan. Great, thanks. So I'm gonna be going through just a brief presentation. This is moving on to the agenda item two, which is the service-based budgeting project update. Uh, as I go through this, we're gonna have about um, 15 minutes. I'll be given a presentation just updating you on the service-based budgeting project. Uh, and then I'll turn it over to Dan Reagan, our deputy director for fiscal services to talk through the revenue analysis. And then we'll come back at the end to just the, the next steps for service-based budgeting to help people understand that. We anticipate we should have 30 to 45 minutes at the end for questions. Um, we're open to taking questions as we're going along. If they're targeted for some of the items that we're discussing, you can type it into the chat, as James mentioned, uh, or raise your hand. If it gets to be too many questions, then I may ask you to hold them all till the end. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and get started. So the main thing we wanted to do was update everyone on the process and the progress through service-based budgeting. As you know, we submitted our final report to the legislature in January, 2021. It really capped the last stage of the SBB process, which was operationalizing service-based budgeting within the department. This was the effort to develop our long-term tool, which we're gonna be using going forward also to identify improvement actions, uh, targeted investments, other types of things that we can do to help advance the uh, current level of the department relative to the mission level needs, and really try and build out the capacity of the department to institutionalize service-based budgeting in its processes going forward. To that end, we've gone through and hired a process analyst, Misty Boring, who some of you probably recognize from some of the recent emails regarding the external advisory committee meetings. You'll see her uh, become increasingly engaged on a lot of these issues. She's been involved for several months now, getting up to speed and really taking over the process development and tracking for the service-based budget process. Service-based budgeting itself is, uh, housed within uh, the administration side of the department, but it pulls on a lot of different areas, including our information technology, data technology division, fiscal, and others in order to accomplish the goals of service-based budgeting, including the data collection, which I'll talk a little bit about at the end as we go through this. We also have uh, at various roles that help support service-based budgeting, including the senior advisor, which is a regional manager or a branch chief, and a scientific advisor to help with the, the identification of subject matter experts and other things as we go through service-based budgeting. So both of those, Julie Vance is the senior advisor, she's on the line, as, large, as well as Laird Hinkle with our OSPR division, who's the scientific advisor. I'm going to give a brief highlight of the gap analysis with our most recent data collection. So we collected data for the fiscal year 1920 back in March was when we started the data collection. It went for about six weeks. So these are updated numbers relative to the fiscal year 1920 data. As you can see, the gap between our current level of service and our mission level of service for staffing varies from the high of 73% for our admin support down to a low of 26% of current level needs for species and habitat conservation. The majority of the areas are really hovering around that three times uh, or three times the need from what we currently have. 
You can see that with the lands and facilities, public use and enjoyment, law enforcement, operational support, permitting environmental protection, and species and habitat conservation. Another way of looking at this is just our current level relative to the mission level of needs. So this is a chart showing the current level hours from greatest to least moving across. So you see admin support has the greatest current level of hours. It also has one of the smaller mission level of needs percentage wise and hour wise. Uh, and that's to be expected because you need the administration to keep things running, keep the department in good shape as far as the various processes. And then some of you likely saw the information from fiscal year 1819. This is a comparison between the data collected for fiscal year 1819 versus fiscal year 1920. Uh, so the left-hand side shows the 1819 data current level. The right-hand side shows the 1920 current level data. You'll see, notice there's a little bit of an uptick across all service areas. That's primarily due for, for the service areas uh, because of a change in the way we collected the temporary scientific and seasonal help information. So we, the first year of the data collection, we collected that information as a snapshot in time of the then active seasonal temp, uh, scientific aids, seasonal help that we're working at that time. And what we did was modify that process for fiscal year 1920 and going forward so that we can collect that information as a better view of the entire seasonal help throughout the year. Uh, because otherwise we felt like we were missing a large portions depending on the time or the season of the year that we were collecting that data. Now, as part of what we're doing for service-based budgeting, the department's going through and not just looking at where there's gaps and what potentially you could need for additional staffing, but also to consider ways to reduce the gap between the mission and the current level staffing needs by various things such as taking a look at our existing missions, policies, and mandates, trying to find if there's ways we can include improve the way that we're doing things to reduce the amount of staff time that's needed, looking to external partners that may be better positioned to help with certain areas, and also targeted investments in technology and equipment that can help either bring about efficiencies or help increase the, uh, the, uh, the ability to bear on existing uh, tasks with the resources and staffing that we currently have. So there's numerous ways to try and address the gap that we're seeing between the current level and the mission level. Uh, labor is the last one. That's the long-term cost for additional staffing. But we want to look through and try and figure out if there's other ways we can do that beyond just increasing staffing. In order to do that, we, we've developed a process through service-based budgeting where we take various topic areas and really dig into, with subject matter experts, some ideas to help reduce the mission level need or to better provide uh, to provide better services for the tasks that we're already doing. And you can think of it as a cone where we sort of start out with a broad topic area, generate ideas, increasingly dig into those ideas more and more as we try to figure out what things can move forward and what's the best use of resources based on the operational improvement actions we identify. You see this play out in the fiscal year 21-22 budget requests. Uh, most, most, uh, most of those targeted investments are identified through things that they can do to help reduce the mission level needs of the department. There are certain actions that are focused primarily on doing more with the resources we currently have. So they may not result in a direct uh, reduction in the mission level need, but they're going to improve the services that we're providing with the staffing that we have. So this is a breakdown and these slides will be posted later so you'll be able to go through. But for each of the various budget requests, we've identified the service areas that would be primarily impacted by those budget requests. And this is it for the targeted one-time investments. Uh, you can see, for example, human wildlife conflict response proposal impacts several different service areas, included on operational support, education and outreach, law enforcement, species and habitat conservation. Others are more focused on particular service areas, such as the 
modernizing California's fish hatchery, op hatchery operations is primarily going to impact lands and facilities, which is where the work that we do for hatcheries, that's the service area that those fall under. As part of SBB, one of the things we've been talking about is the development of the SBB data tool. It's uh, really better to think of this tool as having four distinct components, each of which is critical to managing the SBB data and the information that's collected. So there's the SBB database management, which you can think of as housing the tasks that have been developed for service-based budgeting. We've talked about that through various presentations going forward. I won't spend time here, but essentially we've got, I think it's in the final count, 2,873 different tasks that the department does to meet its mission. And those are all being housed within the SBB data tool and can be managed there. There's also the information that we do through the current level data collection, which we've done two years worth of data now, fiscal year 1819 and 1920. We're gearing up in March to begin the next fiscal year's data collection, and that's going to be on an annual cycle. So that data collection tool is within the SBB data tool itself. There's also the mission level data collection tool. So in addition to the current level, collecting updated mission level information, that's on a five-year timeline, though we can do targeted mission level collection updates as needed. And then finally, there's the SBB Power BI data analytics. So the database management itself is, has a component tool where the administrator, that's primarily Misty Boring, the process analyst, is able to manage those tasks. We've got the current level data collector that's being used by what we call respondents and validators. You can think of them as the managers throughout the department who are collecting information for the individual staff positions that the department has and allocating them to specific tasks. Then we've got the mission level data collection, which is focused on trying to identify the number of times uh, that we need to do particular tasks in order to meet our mission. And then finally, all of that information comes together through our Power BI displays where we're able to dig into the data and assess the information there. Now there's a lot of information in there and there's a lot of different ways to look at the data. So it's important to keep in mind that one of the key roles of the SBB process analysts is to be able to help go in and pull the information that's needed and conduct the analysis that conforms with the assumptions and modeling that goes into service-based budgeting. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Dan Reagan, our Fiscal Services Direct Deputy Director for the revenue analysis process. Great, thanks Nathan. So for the next few slides or a number of slides, we'll walk through the process that we went through, kind of starting with the background of the revenue analysis overview, and then walk through the methodologies and then a few examples of the findings. So Nathan, next slide, please. So as everyone knows, uh, part of the statute and fishing game code section 712.1, directed the department to complete the analysis for the revenue structure and program activities supported by various fund sources. Next slide, please. Part of the analysis was the methodology overview. So we went through and developed the methodologies in which to perform the revenue analysis to ensure consistency across every fund source that we analyzed. Um, the SBB revenue analysis consisted really of three components the fund-based analysis, policy-based analysis, and additional findings. Part of the uh, challenges we ran into, as Chuck and Nathan both said, with nearly 3,000 tasks um, and the number of fund split positions that we have within the department and over 60 fund sources was how the data was being captured and analyzed within the SPV tool. Next slide, please, Nathan. So the funding complexity, complexity challenges, again, um, really exhibited itself with how the data and the complexity of the department's fundings created the challenges in developing a method for analyzing it. One of the most difficult challenges were the number and are the number of positions the department has split funded across multiple fund sources. 
With over 60 funds, the department's nearly half of all the department's staff are funded by multiple fund sources and many tasks are appropriate for multiple fund sources. Next slide, Nathan. The SBB tasks were developed to be broad rather than specific to, fund, to a specific fund source. As a result, a fund may be supporting what appears to be an unrelated task, but upon closer analysis, the fund is appropriate for the work being performed. The SPB position data for the hours associated to a specific task for split funded positions are distributed equally across the funds associated for that position. So for example, um, a position that could be split funded 50% fishing game preservation fund and 50% lake and stream bed alteration dedicated account. Those tasks that are entered by the respondents and validators are blind of the fund source. They're split equally at the 50-50 ratio that person is funded. So this is where the in-depth revenue analysis and process that was developed was critical to kind of untangle this data because on the surface, it may appear something is inappropriate or should be funded by a, a, a more appropriate fund source, which in reality, when we dug into it to look at the actual position and number of hours associated with a given task, deemed to be what just a, how it was split funded and was appropriate. Next slide, please. So upon initial review for the 1819 SBB data cycle, the department identified 10 funds to begin the revenue analysis for appropriate usage uh, and fund appropriateness for the initial fiscal year 1819 data cycle. These funds were Federal Trust Fund, General Fund, Lake and Stream Bed Alteration Dedicated Account, Big Game Management Dedicated Account, Fishing Game Preservation Fund Non-Dedicated, Upland Game Bird, Timber Restoration, Forest Restoration Fund, Reimbursements, Hatcheries and Inland Fisheries Fund, Dungeons Crab Account. Next slide, please, Nathan. Commercial Salmon Stand, oh, sorry. Oh, those were the first 10 funds. I'm sorry, I got jumped there. So those were the 10 funds that we've, that we've already performed the analysis. The department has since prioritized five additional funds for revenue analysis. We're currently getting ready to start as part of the fiscal year 1920 SBB cycle. The revenue process will continue through all department funds. So every year, as we move forward, we'll take on more and more funds. We'll do another review cycle of additional funds that we've not analyzed. Currently, again, we're focusing on, as we speak, currently is focusing on the commercial salmon stamp account, <clears throat> commercial augmented salmon stamp account, commercial salmon vessel permit, duck stamp, and aquaculture. Next slide, please. So each fund analyzed is pre presented to showcase a suite of information demonstrating the current usage and opportunities to utilize a more appropriate fund source. <clears throat> For each fund, we would consider the background, legal citation, purpose, and revenue source. Then we view how it's currently being used in the SBB data. And then it produces a summary of findings. Next slide, please. So the revenue methodologies, it's really primarily two parts with multiple steps within each part. The first part of the revenue analysis method consists of reviewing every task allocated for a given fund for appropriateness. The methodology developed ensures for a consistent review of every task and fund analyzed. Each analysis was performed by a panel of subject matter experts within the department ranging from fiscal staff, myself included, to program staff that had an in-depth knowledge of the particular fund and revenue source that being reviewed. <clears throat> so part one, we really take the SBB data and the data analytics that Nathan said from the SBB uh, Power BI analytics tool. And we'd filter the tasks looking for how those funds, how those positions are currently in tasks are currently funded. That's the important piece here is that through the, through the SBB is it's all reliant on data sets and databases within the department on how those positions are funded. And then it translates over the respondents and data, respondents and validators enter the task data and hours, which then the, through Power BI, we link up to determine how those tasks are funded. One of the challenges, as I said, is that SBB tool in the, the data is blind to the fund source, meaning that if they enter 800 hours for a particular task and that person or position is split funded 50-50, the tool is going to take 400 hours and assign 400 hours for that task to each of the fund sources. 
So through part of the revenue analysis methods, that allows us to kind of undo that 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 commingling of hours to ensure that it is appropriate and that the right fund or the most appropriate fund source is being utilized for those tasks. Next slide, Nathan. One of the things we had to look at was process for our reimbursement contracts. Given that a reimbursement contract is unique because it's paying for a specific, a specific service to be rendered uh, for the given entity. So we did much the similar for the part one A as we did for reimbursements. However, we tied it back to the contract source and looked at the individual contracts performing the services for those given staff to ensure those tasks aligned with the reimbursement contract um, and identified that it was appropriate given under a contract. This was more of kind of a contract review and contract audit using the SPB data because it was tied to the reimbursement fund source uh, for that contract. Next slide, Nathan. Part two is the uh, policy-based analysis. For department-approved tasks funding uh, policies, a reverse analysis was conducted to identify task hours that may be funded, uh, may not be funded from the most ideal fund sources. So all part one and part two were joined for every fund source. Reimbursements was unique for reimbursements. So this was kind of the inverse of it, looking at the tasks, at the task level of a given task and how it should be funded and if it was appropriate to be funded there. One of the challenges we ran into through the SBB review was that of lumpers and splitters for the entry of the data for the given task. So for example, within Lake and Stream Bed Alteration dedicated account, if that person was split funded 50% with let's say Fishing Game Preservation Fund non-dedicated and we saw tasks like CEQA review, um, things that you know at, on the surface you would think that would not be appropriate for a lake and stream bed alteration dedicated account. The team actually had to dig into that particular position to those task hours to determine, and in some cases actually went out to the respondents and validators entering the data to determine what was being actually performed there. Was it a function of their normal position, in which case, for example, upon processing a lake and stream bed alteration permit, it's expected that staff review the CEQA compliance document before issuing the permit to ensure it's appropriate. So was that what they were doing and that's what they interpreted it as with thus being lake and stream bed alteration dedicated account would be appropriate for this because it's part of the issuance of the lake and stream bed permit or was it something else where they actually processing the CEQA documentation to issue a CEQA permit in which case would require further review and possibly an SBB finding. Next slide, Nathan. So <clears throat> while analyzing the revenue data, fund managers discover areas where tasks may be more appropriately funded by another fund source based on the fund usage guidelines, even though these tasks are often required to be formed in conjunction with one another. So this is kind of the example that I used with LSA and CEQA. This often required follow-up with the respondents and validators that enter the SPB data to determine that the positions identified were actually doing were appropriate for that fund, fund case or fund uh, fund on those particular tasks. Next slide, Nathan. So as part of the revenue analysis, we got into find we're, we're into the finding section. The revenue analysis findings were classified by one of six different finding types. We had the policy, which was an SBB task hours entry appears not to be supported by policy uh, set forth by the department. We had ideal funding opportunity where those position fundings appears to be allowable, but maybe not be the most ideal. Funding appropriateness, which was a position for which alternative funding may be more appropriate. Task appropriateness, uh, where SBB task hours entry submitted that did not appear to be the most appropriate for the positions, but were entered. Data entry errors, um, SBB task hours submitted by a respondent that appears to be erroneous. And then that was that one and the last one, which was a PY default coding, where a position's default coding appears to be erroneous. Those two helped the department clean up its data set, um, in which case we would reach out and the team would reach out to the individuals to determine. 
sorry, IT glitch there, um, to determine what the issue really was. So again, the SPP data itself all feeds from how a position is funded. So if a BCP approves a position or approves a number of positions on general fund, they come into the department, fiscal coding is established as general fund, and that is entered into our database. As those positions over time, 20 plus years, move around or things change and positions get redirected, that coding through the process we can have typos, we can have you know, glitches in our system where how the person is funded versus how they're charging the work they're performing don't align. And so this would be resulted and found within the SPV data by what would appear to be inappropriateness or more ideal fund source there when we reach out and find out, looked at the finding, no, this is a PY default coding error or data entry error, meaning the person did not understand what they were looking at entered the tasks within the wrong subprogram or something of that nature. Next slide, Nathan. So findings for each fund, a summary of findings for each fund um, was provided and we develop a finding category, again, based on one of the six categories previously mentioned, um, and as well as any criteria we're looking at, any kind of thresholds, we have positions that are split funded up to nine different ways. And when you get to such a, a, such a finite and high level of split funding, a lot of times the noise and the data that we brought in from split funding nine different ways created issues. As Nathan mentioned earlier, one of the things we learned was how to capture the data for our temp help staff. Because of this, there was a lot of data anomalies that would appear that were often based on the data captured from the temp help staff, which caused for this change. One of the other things we discovered is if we were to look at every single position for a particular task, often we were talking fractional of hours. So for each revenue analysis was unique. There wasn't necessarily a set standard where we always held the threshold at five split funded ways, three. It really based on when we looked at the analysis, what level of data was required to ensure we were capturing the most reliable data set with the least amount of material impact. So if we had nine, if we raised the split funding threshold, for example, to nine, it only resulted in an extra 300 hours. It, but the level of kind of what could appear as funding questions rose we would limit that down and come back and review those at a later time, knowing that we felt comfortable with 99.9% .9 of the majority of hours being captured um, within the process. Next slide, Nathan. So this, the next few slides are gonna be some examples from within the funding uh, process and the kind of the, the high level reports that were generated. A lot of this you can see within the appendixes from the SBB final report. So for general fund, again, as the process indicated, we started kind of, with, we started with the legal citation, the purpose of the fund, and really the proper use of the fund. Next slide, Nathan. As you can see, general fund supports a large variety of subprograms throughout the department. So it really impacts the number of tasks it has and the breadth within general fund does for the department is significant. Next slide. So this is the current use broken down by the top 40 subprograms. And as you can see here, there are, you'll see subprograms that you immediately would raise a question, why is this being funded by general fund? And again, keep in mind, this data set here is just a raw data poll of current the top current fund hours within subprograms. So this takes into account and has within it those positions that are split funded, for example, law enforcement, um, almost the majority of every one of our law enforcement, all of our wardens is split funded. And it has it across, and you can see within cannabis enforcement, um, you know, like a street alteration agreements, things of that nature, a lot of those, when we dug into them on the surface, immediately appeared to be, that should be a finding. And as the team dug into them, we realized that no, they're not a finding, it's a result of a split funded position. So 
for those hours, we review down to the actual hours entered for every position to ensure that the split funded ratios did not exceed the hours. So what I mean by that is, again, we'll use if they're funded 50-50, 50% general fund, 50% Lake and Stream Bed Alteration Agreement, and that person entered the hours that would exceed the 50% threshold. So 1,600 were the hours, so 1,600 hours that was entered. If they would enter 1,000 hours for Lake and Stream Bed, thus being 400 hour, or, uh, 600 hours on general fund, we knew we had a potential finding there for Lake and Stream Bed that was needed to be addressed. Next slide, Nikki. This is the general fund summary. So as you can see, uh, hours considered within the analysis was almost 746,000 hours, which represents 17% of the total SBB hours. For general fund, we did hold the split funding threshold to three ways. Um, it resulted in two ideal funding opportunities, two fund appropriatenesses, one task appropriateness for a total of five findings. And within those, the, the departments immediately started addressing all findings for any SBB tasks um, or finding categories for the 10 funds that we've already reviewed. We've already taken measures and started correcting all of those, if not have already corrected them. Next slide, Nick. So this example is gonna be the Lake and Stream Bed Alteration Dedicated Account. And for, so you'll notice it's the, it's the same format. We kept that consistency throughout for all the funds and we're keeping it going forward for the next five funds we're doing and onward. Um, we are learning things as we do this, as Nathan said, again, with the temp help, for example, um, on how we're capturing the data as well as process improvements within the revenue with revenue analysis going forward, um, particularly around the split funding thresholds and ways to make the data cleaner. We're also looking at trying to limit the number of split funding, which was also Nathan will touch on in, in a little bit on funding flexibility. So for Lake and Streambed alteration dedicated account, um, again, hours reviewed were 69, roughly 69,000 hours, which represented 1.6% of all SBB hours. And the split funding threshold was held to two ways, which did result in a total of seven findings uh, across the six categories with one PY default coding issue, uh, five task appropriatenesses and one funding appropriateness. Next slide, Nathan. So the policy-based findings, um, the example we're using is the hatchery subprogram. For the hatchery subprogram, approximately 95% of the subprogram were supported to be uh, found most appropriate fund source. The policy uh, for this hatchery subprogram is funded by most appropriately by Hatcheries Inland Fisheries Fund, Fishing Game Preservation Fund, non-dedicated reimbursements and federal trust fund. And as you can see, we of the of the 184, almost 185,000 hours, 175,000 hours was deemed most appropriate. And this captures the subprograms for how by the fund, or sorry, by fund for the subprogram of how it broke out with a lot of the lower fund levels captured. And within that, we're reviewing the most appropriate to determine paths forward. And with that, I will turn it back over to Nathan for funding flexibility. Thanks, Dan. So as Dan mentioned, as we were going through the revenue analysis, the, the analysis lent itself to some additional findings related to flexibility of funding. And just for perspective, this is a snapshot of uh, the chart shows the current level staffing for fiscal year 1920, uh, where we had an enacted budget for 2021 of 633 million, managing over 60 funds, including 29 sub-dedicated accounts within the Fish and Game Preservation Fund, and 32 additional funds outside of that. 
So a really complex funding structure, which as Dan mentioned, led to a lot of complications relative to uh, the revenue analysis and the data collection and was probably the topic area that took the most amount of time just thinking through and addressing to try and come up with the best way to be able to conduct the, the revenue analysis given all the different complexities that Dan mentioned previously. So as part of that, what we were seeing, uh, a trend that we were seeing within the revenue analysis was that you would have a lot of high hour gap sub programs that would have a large number of various supporting fund sources. And oftentimes those fund sources or funding provisions would have similar types of guidelines or usage uh, provisions that were very similarly related, but they were sufficiently different and they had separate funds that they needed to be maintained and accounted for separately. A lot of these though seemed as though they could lend themselves to consolidation. So they trying to identify those funds that have similar purposes and consolidating them would allow the department to continue to do the work that those funds are focused on but give additional flexibility in being able to manage it and to help reduce the total number of funds that the department is trying to manage throughout, the, uh, throughout its annual fiscal cycles. Finally, I just wanted to give an overview of the annual processes that are going on for the service-based budgeting process. And you can find more detail about this in the operational plan appendix for the final report. But I think it's important just to understand that there's several different processes that are happening within SBB at any given time. So I've mentioned the mission level updates, which are on a five year cycle, but can do targeted updates annually as needed. We've got the current level refresh, we call it, which happens annually, uh, getting ready to start doing that in March. We've also got the ongoing data review and analysis once we have that incoming data accomplished. So roughly around uh, end of March, April, once we've collected the data, we start going through and doing an additional review and gap analysis. And then as part of that too, we're doing our ongoing revenue analysis and operational improvement idea development. And those feed into the upcoming uh, budget cycles bill analyses, those types of issues. So it's important to keep in mind that not only are we doing um, annual updates to the data, but that data is being used to help feed into multiple different processes within SBB, but also within the department's normal bill analysis, uh, budget proposal development timelines that are happening for multiple fiscal years at once. So there's several different things happening within SBB all on the same timeline and overlapping. And that's why that process analyst role that Misty Boring is playing is so critical to operationalizing and institutionalizing SBB within the larger CDFW processes. So with that, that's largely everything we wanted to cover as part of this update. I mentioned earlier, we're gonna post these slides so that they'll be available for people to download and review. Um, the, the goal we were trying to do is to help people be able to understand in particular the revenue analysis aspect, since that was the primary difference from the previous updates and be able to use that to go into the SVB final report appendices and dig into information a little bit more as you would like to. We've got some additional slides that we'll make available as part of this presentation related to the specific gaps that we're seeing for the service areas broken down at a sub-program level. So you're welcome to go in, look at that information and dig into that a little bit more. And so with that, I think we're gonna open it up for questions on this agenda item service-based budgeting project update. And we've got several different deputy directors and others that are available to help answer questions. So I'll, I'll play the host or the moderator for receiving the questions. If Julie can help identify those that have their hands raised, please raise your hand if you're joining by Zoom through the app, or you'll need to hit star nine to raise your hand 
through the telephone function and we'll be able to call on you and go through those questions. You're also welcome to type questions into the chat. So with that, Chuck, I'll turn it over to you if you have any last comments or, or thoughts you want to add before we jump into the questions. Yeah, I do. Um, so obviously we, we start a budget, we're in a budget cycle and we'll have a more appropriate venue for that beginning this Wednesday. And then look, look be upfront about it. When you read the report and if you've been on the journey with us, you know all roads lead back to the question, well, what is a solution for sustainable funding over time? The thing I would wanna say right now before we go Q and A is in my view, the report you just heard, I think the department's done a great job on the assignment we got <clears throat> focused in this way. In 2018, we got the assignment in statute. We hired Deloitte, we engaged with all y'all and we did this analysis, which we'd never done before. And now we emerge with data we've never had before and the ability to use the data in ways we had never had before. We've submitted the report, which was also an assignment. And it, in some ways it's just the beginning because we will use this ongoing. Long after me, I hope, long after many of us, there's this annual cycle, every five-year cycle, there's the Power BI tool that allows Misty and her position to run data in all different directions and display it visually. And it's been baked into the decision-making and the internal work the department does. Getting that data, getting this system, getting ourselves committed and modernized that way itself, I think is a success. Set aside you know, what happens this budget cycle, set aside kind of the long-term endeavor around a sustainable funding source. So I think we got a lot of time for Q&A and Nathan, I'll flip it back to you. Thanks, Chuck. I'll go ahead and pull up my video too. Okay, so we'll go ahead and start Q&A. And like I said, you're welcome to type the questions into the chat. You're also welcome to raise your hand and Julie Vance will help call on you and we can, we can have a more interactive question and answer session. But I see there's already a couple questions in there. So the first question is from Catherine. Does the non-dedicated fish and game preservation fund include any general fund? So Dan, I think you're probably best positioned to answer this one. Sure, and um, Catherine, I think if you're unmuted, um, I'm a little more clarification on exactly what you mean or what you're asking. Julie, can we get Catherine unmuted, please? You should be able to unmute. Yeah, I just got the prompt, thank you. So, um, I saw in some slides that general fund was distinguished from the non-dedicated fish and game preservation fund. I'm aware that there's various sources of revenue that go into the non-dedicated fish and game preservation fund. My question is, when you show the non-dedicated fish and game preservation fund, does that ever have any general fund dollars in it? Or so, is the fund set totally separate? So it could have tasks that are split funded with people that are performing general fund, general fund tasks. So if they are going to use my example, if they're split funded in this case, 50% general fund, 50% non-dedicated, then yes, those tasks would appear. And part of the revenue analysis that we did is we dove to that level, looking at what those positions that were split funded that way on the tasks that may not be, or may be most appropriate for non-dedicated or vice versa, most appropriate for general fund, fell within the appropriate hour threshold, meaning that they didn't exceed that ratio based of how that person is funded. But on that general fund slide by sub-program, Catherine, I believe is what the slide you're referring to, there, that would be the same circumstance. So yeah, it could have tasks with people that are split funded across non-dedicated and general fund. Uh, I'll have to think about that, well, <laughs> but well, thank you. <laughs> Catherine, 
Dan, let me see if I'm tracking you. It, Dan, I, I heard Dan's answer to be maybe, but it's because the position you're looking at, a portion of the position could be relying on general fund. So it may not be so much the task as the tasks are running back to the position and whether that position is split funded between various sources. Dan, is that correct? That is correct, Chuck, because there's no way for the data, there's no way for the SPB tool to say that those general fund hours or those fishing game pre preservation fund hours belong to that particular fund. I'll still have to think about that some more. I mean, I appreciate the point about having different sources that may be appropriate, but if you're breaking it down to the tasks, you should be able to tell. Right. Correct. And we can we can tell what how much and what tasks are fishing game preservation fund, but that requires and this is exactly what we did was we went down to the position level for those that were split funded where there is any question of a more appropriate fund source to validate those hours. And just just for additional context on this. I, I may have mentioned it before, and I know uh, Kevin Matthews with Deloitte is on as well, and maybe have be able to share some additional perspective. You know, one of the goals we had with the revenue as an analysis initially was to try and find a way where we could do just a simple breakdown, positions allocated to tasks, pull the funding that those tasks have, and be able to go through and um, do a direct analysis based on the information that gets displayed in Power BI through the SVB data tool. But, and this kind of goes with some of the complexities uh, that Dan spoke about, about, because of the number of funds and split funding, split funded positions and the overlap in funds and other things, it became very difficult very quickly to do that. So it took us quite a lot of time to try and think through what we could do in a way that would be responsive. And so the processes that Dan described were the ones that we worked through to be able to dig into the data and be able to answer those questions. Um, but because of the complexity of the funds and the split funding positions, all of those things really contributed uh, along with the, the one thing I'd say to keep in mind is that part of the reason we did SBB was to be able to describe the services that the department does uh, in a way that's helpful and useful and not, and it wasn't designed in a way to specifically break down by organizational units or other things. So those types of complexities really came into the revenue analysis as we started going through this. Uh, let, me, let me offer a thought here too, and then I wanna to turn to Kim's question in the Q and A, but the other thing I'd say, Catherine, just me thinking out loud, I still think we're kind of at the beginning, right? So as an example, just compared to it like a year ago and now we were able to kind of rethink, rerun uh, labor and tasks that allowed us to more precisely account for uh, temporary help. So you saw that in one of the earlier slides that accounts for some of the bump up small percent points. And I think we're gonna keep finding moments like that. So we did these first 10 fund analyses. It's gonna generate a bunch of questions from y'all and others. And my advice is we just plow those questions back into the EAC and it informs how we're doing it and you know, next meeting and next five analyses. So I think this will be ongoing and we're just gonna keep getting better and better at it. Um, thank you all for your uh, responses. I appreciate that. I, I guess what I'm getting back to, and I think you just partly answered that, Chuck, thank you, is, you know, ultimately there are things that the department performs that really should be funded by the uh, people taking advantage of this particular service. And so really trying to understand in particular with the general fund, where it's going and how it's going to be used and who is using it, you know, recognizing the complexity is, you know, at least speaking personally, certainly one of the things that 
um, we hope to get out of service-based budgeting. So thank you. And again, um, really super work by uh, the department thus far on this. Thank you. Hey, Tim, let me, go ahead, sorry. Um, just to make sure Nathan, Dan, Kim asks whether we use the tool to inform the current January one-time proposals. And if not, can we use it? So y'all wanna take that and then I'll, I'll weigh in. Yeah, I, I, can, I can start things off. So the short answer is yes, we use the tool to generate the current VCP. And when I say yes, it, it, uh, less so than the tool and it was more thinking through the operational improvement actions that I mentioned uh, in the slide presentation. So thinking of different ways that we can help close the gap without the need for additional staffing necessarily. And so a lot of those budget proposals that you see are really designed around areas that the department sees for helping to reduce the gap. You know, the hatcheries is a good example of that. And I, Stafford is on, I see, so he may be able to talk more to that if you'd like to dig into any of those in particular. But the basic idea was to try and identify improvement actions to help close the gap. Not every one of those uh, one-time investments are specifically designed to close the gap versus being able to help the department do a better job with the resources that it has. So some of them are service oriented versus gap closing oriented. So with that caveat, um, the, the short answer though is yes, it, it was you to help inform that. And what you can and what you can do or you can see is you can go, you know, area or line item. So you can look at human wildlife conflict response, which of course in the budget is seven million. And then you can connect it to service level, you know, areas affected. So operational support, education, outreach, law enforcement, species, habitat conservation. And we have some internal principles, which are the more service areas benefited, the better when you're kind of thinking through decisions. And then you can pull data and you can look at total current hours and gap hours. You can do that, you know, for each. And someone's going to eventually say today or, you know, this week or next, well, what you've picked here doesn't seem to reflect your biggest, you know, need. Fair point in some places. We're also using the principle this go around of, you know, one time compared to ongoing permanent. So that was part of the mix. Um, I think the more challenging thing is the second part of your question, Kim, and I'll kick it to you. Well, if you, if you can analyze what to pick and where to put one time, how do you do a subsequent analysis that shows you, you know, post appropriation, how much your level shrank? I think we're gonna be able to see that, but it might be we see it more after the fact than we can project it before the fact, but that's my, my sense on that. I'm not data fluent in this like Dan is, but Kim, I think the second part of your, your your question is actually the trickier, harder part than the first part. So at, at the risk of inviting chaos, Chuck, if it's okay with you, I thought we would, at, at, we had a suggestion to yeah. let people just chime in and have this a little bit more fluid. So anybody who would like to just have an open mic to be able to talk, uh, raise your hand. And we're just gonna allow people to have a conversation, which I think is something we'd welcome. And if we were in person, that would certainly happen on its own. So if you're interested in just being a part of that conversation, please raise your hand. Julie will go and click it so that you can unmute yourself. If you're not talking or um, you, know, you have a lot of background noise, please keep that in mind. And we may reserve the ability to mute you if there's a lot of background noise or anything like that. But otherwise, if people could just go ahead and raise their hands, and that'll allow for a little bit more interactive conversation here. So Wayne, you had a question. I'm gonna go ahead and just click allow to talk for you if you'd like to do that live. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, go ahead. Hi guys. Hey, I just wanted to know in the, all the analysis, we, we see the gap, we understand the complexity of it. Did you guys find any kind of like low hanging fruit that 
would enable the ENG, the NGO community to help engage and partner with you guys to help, you know, take some of this pressure off? Or what is the process going forward for us to in the NGO community to, to become partners with the department? Thank you. Yeah, good question. I'll say, uh, you know, the area, I, and I'm, I'm trying to think if there were any particular ideas that were developed in the operational improvement actions discussions, you know, I, I, I haven't been able to think of any directly, but I know we've, we've had some conversations around that in the lands context, um, working with local partners on the ground, either to help, uh, you know, have more eyes on the ground with um, ensuring that we're not getting uh, trespass or other things like that on some of the lands, you know, things where we can help rely on those local partners to help make sure that the lands are being used the way they're intended to be used. But I would say, you know, I would use this also SVB as an invitation for you to reach out with ideas for us to help explore. So we may have ideas that we're thinking of, but there's very likely that you may have ideas that you'd like to bring to the department and consider as well. So. I would say don't don't rely on just us to come up with those ideas if if you think the NGOs have some other ones that would work well. Thank you. So it looks like um, Kim Delfino had a pretty specific question. I'm going to open it up for Kim, and then next we'll go to Mark. We, there we go, Kim. You should be able to weigh in. Let me try that again. Sorry, can you guys hear me now? Yes, there you are. <laughs> okay, cool. Um, yeah, I just, I, I, so there's a bunch of category, the top 40 categories, or top, I'm sorry, top 40 sub programs. Um, I'm just wondering if there's a definition associated with each, with each of those sub programs in terms of what the activities are. Um, I just, you know, because I noted that it, in the general fund use, the largest amount was hunting and fishing enforcement, but then there's a bunch of other different enforcement categories that are in there. And I just am trying to understand like, what do you, what, what, what is it that is captured when you say hunting and fishing enforcement or even other categories that are in there? Yeah, so for this one, I'll probably look to Dan and then Chief Best and Nate Arnold may have additional insight too. Sure, I can, I can start it off and then I'll pitch it over to, to uh, Chief Best. And so for the sub programs, there's tasks that are defined within those sub programs and that is within the definitions for the task catalog that's that we have posted online. And so as staff respondents and validators enter the tasks um, that kind of bins it into what sub program it's in based on the task that's selected. So that's why you see the sub programs um, listed with a variety of tasks based on how they're funded within enforcement. When SBB was initially rolled out, the group spent a lot of time kind of building the structure, as Nathan said, between the program sub programs down to the task levels of what should be captured for a variety of reasons. So that's why they're structured that way for the differences between what you're seeing between cannabis enforcement, hunting and fishing enforcement. I'll turn that over to Chief Bess and Nathaniel Arnold. Hey Kim, does Dan's um, explanation answer your question? Uh Kind of, I just need to, I'm pulling out my task catalog and just going to look through there. And if I have any questions, I'll just email you guys directly. I don't want to take a bunch of time on this, but yeah, thank you. Okay. Just, to last, just to answer thank that you. very last part of your question there, the, the, and this is for everybody on the CDFW SBB webpage. If you go there, there's a copy of the, the task catalog that we had posted previously that you can maneuver through it and identify tasks by programs, uh, sub programs and service levels. Hey, so Kim, you're doing me proud that you have the task registry that, that close at your fingertips. And I, I also think the task- Yes, the task I know. <laughs> <laughs> I think that the task registry probably has some insight for your question, Wayne. Um, 
you know, that's it's a it's a pretty big spreadsheet, but you can maybe see in there ideas where things we're doing can get achieved through improved external partnerships. And, and this is a self-serving plug, but if you go back to an earlier moment in the department's dynamic, I think we actually institutionally worked pretty hard to not, to not ever get to this level of transparency around data. So again, I'll, I'll pitch that as a success, uh, you know, bottom line here too. We got to do this work. We got to be transparent about it. We got to put it out there with y'all who are our external folks and the data is the data and we try to improve using it. So next we have a question from Mark Smith. Hey, Chuck guys, this is Mark Smith. So first of all, this is super complicated. And from the questions we've been getting from really, really sharp people, smarter than I am, I know this is complicated for a lot of folks. Um, so one, I appreciate all the work that you're doing and the effort to try to educate us. I guess my question basically distills down to as you did this cost analysis, have you been able to determine in any kind of sense how much more general fund you really need to fund the department in an ongoing basis and I, and I say general fund versus user generated revenue right so Catherine keyed on something earlier which was that in some instances users should pay for the services that they're getting um, many of us have been involved with you through the r3 process i don't think that hunters or anglers would object to paying for the services that they get but you're not going to be able to solve this problem just by raising license fees across the board. So in your analysis of all of these tasks and what's general fund and what's dedicated revenue, how's that supposed to work out? And how can you give us some insight into that? Because clearly, again, you're not going to be able to solve this problem by just raising license fees. Right. So while a lot of this does sound complicated and it, it will make my head numb, there's an entirely different part of this, which is pretty simple. Uh, Given the assignments and the mission of the department, our current service level is less than the level required to meet our mission. I think anyone on this phone call that's been engaged would confess that's what they thought before we did the analysis, and that's what's been pointed at for many years. So lo and behold, here we are. So Mark, I'm not going to come out and say how much general fund or how much fee increase any more than I'm going to say... <clears throat> you know, who I'm pulling for in the Super Bowl. But when you look at some of the numbers, here are the ones that are interesting to me. And here's how I kind of think about this. You can go to each of the eight service areas. So administration, and we, we publish this information. Y'all have got it now. You can see that we estimate it's a 1.37 gap differential between current mission, which means we're providing a service level at 73% of you know, 100%. And then you can go to education outreach and you can see that we're providing service at a 56% level. Lands and facilities is at a 36% level. Law enforcement is at a, I think it's a 33%. Operational support is at 33%. Public use and enjoyment is at 33%, again, of 100 Permitting and environmental protection is at 29%. That's a 3.45 gap differential. And species and habitat conservation, we're at a 26% of 100%. So if you look at that, then to me, you can go look at, well, what are you doing there? What, what is in the gap? You can decide, well, is that fee, general fund, combination thereof, combination with one-time investments, you know, combination with department efficiencies, it's going to be all of the above in each of those gap areas. And to be totally honest about it, we're going to have a lot of our cherished stakeholders across some spectrum. Some in some moments are going to want it to be general fund and some in other moments are going to want it to be fees. And that's always been a, a, a complexity within, you know, us as a stakeholder group.
We do not appear to have any more outstanding questions. Oh, uh, a comment, not a question. Okay, so I'll follow up on that then. Um, and again, I really wish we could be in the same space where we could have a dialogue about this, understanding yeah. the complexities of the world we live in right now. I mean, For it sure. seems to me that we've got to use the momentum that's generated by the release of this report to put mm -hmm. proposals on the table again. And I know you and I have talked about this. I've talked about this with other people. You know, we keep, we don't have a solution on the table in front of us. And whatever that solution is, whether that is an increase in user fees coupled with a responsible increase in the amount of general fund because these are public trust values and something else, you know, we need something to coalesce around to talk about. And the momentum behind this report is hot right now and it won't be a year from now, right? And um, we've spent a lot of time and a lot of money and a lot of effort and you've done several things concurrently. You're trying to restructure and get more people in hunting and fishing. You're trying to offer different types of programs and services that people want to invest in to help fund your bottom line. The legislature and the administration have a responsibility to talk about the general fund investments here because these are a lot of public trust values. Um, it just seems to me like we need to be doing more to put something on the table to actually talk about a solution. Yeah, I hear, I hear you. And I'm, I'm anticipating that's gonna be a question to me when we get to Wednesday in budget hearing. Okay, we have a question from Jennifer Fearing. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. yes. I was gonna open with thanking the department, but I'm gonna actually open with thanking Mark and saying I agree with everything he just said. Um, so my second comment will be to thank the department for all of the work. Um, I, I too, to, ha to think of all of the resources and all of your time, the thousands of staff hours that went into all of this, um, we, we've been at this precipice at various times before. Um, we, some of us were all involved with the Fish and Wildlife Strategic Vision 10 years ago. There were, when we did that, we cited to prior iterations of groups of people who had also convened to flag this. So this is a super, I mean, a long running, decade long kind of challenge. And you all have done the work the legislature asked you to do to position um, us again to try to center this conversation and I would be lying if I didn't say I was disappointed um, that the budget didn't already include um, the, the thing to operate around that Mark was just alluding to, the idea that we could all kick, um, kick around that's in addition to um, the kind of historical fee, user fee approach and general fund approach. Um, I hope that that we are able to land something like that and have a bigger conversation and work collectively because I think we're in a unique moment also of stakeholder alignment. So outside the department of wanting to try to address this collectively and everyone wanting everyone wanting to see, you look across that chart and there's not much positive news <laughs> for any stakeholder um, in, that, in that overarching gap analysis chart. Um, so, I would just encourage, I can't see, I wish I was in a room also with all of my colleagues that I've known who I am envisioning are in this like Zoom room, but invisible to me, like, please reach out, let's connect. Um, some of us are trying to connect around um, a push to the legislature and others to seize this moment, to seize the interest that the governor and others have around biodiversity and empower this department to like be able to live up to our, all of our expectations. So I would love to, um, personally would love to connect with anyone who shares that interest. Cause I, I think we have a once in our lifetime, like our professional lifetime, I don't know how much energy I have to go around about this again for the next decade. <laughs> so, um, but I think all of us have a passion for the mission. Um, that means we have to try to try to dig deep now. Um, can I, that, all of that is like speechifying, sorry, but I do have a question. I mean, I would love to know more. That general fund slide that went by intrigued me too. And I apologize if that's been in previous um, presentations and I just was asleep um, during them. But um, 
I'm, I'm intrigued at looking at that. I'm almost in, I wish there's a corollary slide. Maybe, maybe it exists and you could point me to it. When I look at that and I see the um, kind of, you could come up with the percent of hours, you know, uh, that each of those are taking total of the general fund. So I see like Kim, Ra Kim raised the first one, the largest bucket looks like it's going to warden patrol um, work kind of writ large. Um, but that doesn't tell me what percent of warden patrol work is done is funded by the general fund. Like it tells me how much general fund hours are how many hours general funds are paying for, but what are the total hours to that activity? Because I'm just trying to get a sense to Mark's prior question to the degree to which we've had this time immemorial kind of debate with all of each other about who's subsidizing who. <laughs> and I think that's only going to be more interesting and I bet your data would help us slice some of that more to really think about what that right mix going forward is. So, so Kim are you saying like that chart can also facilitate percent to total so you have a total amount of general fund and it, you're asking whether it's possible to see each sub program that's calling on that total what its percent is relative to the others well, I think I can do that from the chart. What what uh -huh. the chart shows is that, it, as I understood it, I just snap, screenshotted it and I have only mm -hmm. glanced at it while you've been talking, but it looks like it's the top 40 sets, of, you know, by mm -hmm. hours, the top mm -hmm. 40 programs that receive general fund kind of rank ordered by total amount of hours that yeah. are credited to the general paid for by the general fund. I have the flip question. It, let's so here. Thank you, Nathan. If 121,500 hours of hunting and fishing enforcement are funded by the general fund, what are the mm -hmm. total fund hours of hunting and fishing enforcement? So that Got I it. get a sense of how much the general fund is contributing fund. to that task. For that total program. Got it. Yeah, that's, that's Dan, I think that's statistically not difficult, right? Because we have that, those numbers. Correct. Okay. Hey, J Jennifer, I'm, I'm just my two cents. So if finance is on the phone, apologies for saying this, but like as best I can tell, having worked on this as long as y'all have, you know, you really can't create operational efficiencies to completely deal with uh, anything, anywhere from a 1.37 all the way to a 3.8 gap. You can't do that. And similarly, you can't do, you can't cover that range of gap. And I don't know, you know, at the extreme, maybe that's a $600 million gap. I, I couldn't tell you. You can't do it all in one time. And you probably, you can't fee out of that. Like what angler is going to contemplate that or what business? And my guess is you can't general fund your way out of that either because that is a competed for fund. So it's probably some of all of that. And then eventually someone's got to figure out and what's additive, like what's an additional thing that you put with those other improvements. And there you have it. I mean, does the analysis that you're, this is Mark Smith again, does the analysis you're working on Chuck, at least give us the ability to determine what part of that gap can be closed with one-time funds versus what part of that gap has to be closed with ongoing revenue? Is that, you know, those are two different but very important questions, right? I mean, as advocates in the community who have supported uh, futile approaches to one-time revenue from say the previous governor and even back before that, um, and that's always, you know, a very, a very challenging conversation. If this, if this analysis can start to give us that kind of information, that's really valuable to starting to solve the problem. And I don't know whether the tool that you've created allows you to have that insight. It seems to me that it, it should, but I don't, I don't understand the back end well enough, right? I'm still trying to deal with communities who are still concerned that their license revenue may be going may be used to support activities that aren't part of you know the activity that they purchase a license for which is a whole other conversation um so it's just challenging without knowing the back end so, so I'll, I'll try and describe just kind of at a blunt level the back end question or the the tool side of it as far as one time versus staffing 
the SBB tool and analysis is conducted and developed entirely based on staffing hours. So the short answer is you can't pull up through the SBB data tool and have an easily identified one-time investment and that will tell you it will close X hours on the gap. Um, but that's why we go through the operational improvement action side of things to be able to help identify those improvement actions that will help reduce the gap. And by and large, those improvement actions are things that cut across multiple different tasks. So um, you're, you're talking potentially multiple tasks uh, or multiple sub-programs in addition to tasks. But the short answer is on the backside, the tools developed based on SBB um, CDFW staffing hours, not based on trying to identify the one-time investments, though the, the processes that we've built in is focused on trying to identify those one-time investment opportunities and other operational improvements. So let's play out an example there and we're just mindful of time. We don't have to keep chatting to fill the space, but so one of the one-time investments y'all know is proposed in January 10, I'm just picking one. I think it's 7 million for human wildlife conflict. And you can go read the BCP and see the potential use. I'll just make up a potential use. Imagine you use a portion of one time to build yourself a couple more traps, not to trap something, but rather when we have an animal interfacing with humans and our wardens need to tranquilize it and then remove it, you know, release it back in the wild. Having more traps located in better places would cut down on theoretically the time for a staff person to drive farther to get it to then go back to the incident site, right? Theoretically. So you can you can see that the seven million for human wildlife touches five or six of the eight different core service areas. I think you can make a reasonable prediction the investment in that space will shrink your labor hours, right? But I don't think until perhaps after the fact, when you're looking backwards, you can see how much the labor hours may change and then try to translate that into, uh, you know, the color of the gap shifting. That's my own thinking. You have heard me say it, I went to law school to avoid math, so I'm making that up. Dan, does that track in your mind as a... Yeah, it does, Chuck. We don't have the ability right now in the tool to correlate a one-time OED investment to staff hours. Um, we can do it to exactly the way you, you described. We are working towards something like that, but we haven't gotten there yet. Thank you. I'm not seeing any more questions. Well, we could give everyone back half an hour. I think we're scheduled till three. Um, Y'all deserve a thanks as much as anyone at the department. Most of you were members with me in the vision process. And here we are a decade later. Um, and we wouldn't have gotten this far, even though I know you think we're, we're not as far as we should be without you. So the department owes y'all a huge props and thanks as well. And then bef before we end, I'm going to get one last chance for questions on this agenda item. Since it is a public meeting, we'll have one more agenda item for public comment for items not on the agenda. But are there any any last comments or questions anybody wants to add to, to the discussion on SBB? Hearing none, we're going to go ahead and do the last public comment uh, for items not on the agenda. This is our last agenda item. If anybody's got comments they want to say not related to SVB, now's the time to do it. All right. I think we can end the meeting then. Um, appreciate everybody for joining. And again, be sure to check out the SVB webpage. Uh, as I mentioned before, there's the task catalog that's available through that. It's also got a copy of our what we do chart. Uh, you can also find the entire final report and the appendices that go along with it, which I recommend the riveting reading 
and if you have time to go through them all. Okay, thank you, everybody. Thank you. I don't turn it off.